Good morning. I want to welcome you today to the church that uh, Jesus visits and touches people, helps people, encourages people, saves people from themselves and the lots of other good things. But I figure the only reason we gather is because of him. He's the one that taught us and he said, don't neglect the gathering of yourselves together and we know the good that comes from that. We have a place of accountability, a place of uh, growing friendships and so forth. And I certainly want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers here today uh, and those who are not present. Wasn't it a wonderful idea that God said, uh, put a man and a woman together to raise children and hang on to them until they grew up and became adults and then kick them out so they could <laughs> replicate? Wasn't that a wonderful plan? I so appreciate God's plan. It's just wonderful. I, I was uh, early morning prayer and I was thinking of all of the mothers and especially remembering and honoring the one that uh, bore me. As a matter of fact, it's her fault I'm here. She, uh, two times, she uh, gave me a birth, but she also prayed that one of her sons would be a preacher. And I guess the lot fell on me because all of the rest that some of them could have been, I think, but they did not pursue that. They pursued other things. So here I am. But I want to honor my, my mother today. Uh, she gave birth to uh, 12 children in her lifetime, married when she was 18. Eight boys and two girls. Well, really nine boys and three girls, but two of them died in infancy. Her name was Lydia. Uh, people in our church called her Lydie. I don't know where they got Lydie out of Lydia, but they did. And that's a Hoosierism, I guess, of Lydia. But uh, she, and, she and my dad decided when they were first married that they would have 12 children. I can't think of such a stupid <laughs> commitment to one another, but they made it and they did it. That's what's even interesting. They did it. They had 12 children, eight boys, nine boys, and three girls. But the thing I remember about her, she's just a short woman, about five foot three. And uh, all the work that that woman did, my, oh my, um, helped outside, you know, took care of the chickens, took care of the wash. That's a lot of wash, you know. I've seen that piled up in the place where we did the clothes washing and that's just mounds of stuff and kept us all straight, kept us all on track. And it was just a, a beautiful place to grow up. I wish everybody could have a similar place to grow up. And as I watch the world coming unglued today, uh, we'll never go back to those days, but I'll tell you what, I am so, so thankful that I lived through those days. And the, the depression in a sense was a blessing. You know, we had no gadgets, no extra money, so. We clung pretty close to home and did the work around the farm to feed the family and take care of friends. And ch church was our social activity. And uh, you, you know, is that me? Here we go again. When you have wireless stuff, things happen. It's something from outer space that's doing this here. <laughs> they said that they've turned loose some new waves out in our city and that interferes with our wireless transmission. Isn't that nice? But anyhow, uh, I do want to honor mothers today and honor every family. Uh, another one thing I wanted to say about my mother and father, I don't know what they instilled in us, but they instilled something. But the 10 children that survived have all, all got married and all had children except the eldest and all have stayed married to this date. Now, I'm not saying we're all lovely people and that we're all that compatible. But I'm saying it's something from the teaching and the genes that mom and dad put in us that it's like one lady said, 
when they found out they'd been married 50 some years, she said, well, we were married in a time when something got broke, you fix it. A lot of wisdom in that, wasn't there? And that's kind of the age that we grew up in. You didn't throw things away, you fixed it. So, as we come to Luke, the 12th chapter today, I think Jesus is trying to teach the disciples something about how to live life in a way that when something gets broken, you fix it. So before we begin on the chapter, let's pray. Uh, Father, I want to thank you for all of the good and great things that we have seen you do in our hearts and our minds, in our lives and our families. And we're so grateful for the mothers who have the patience to watch us grow up, uh, tend to us, nourish us, teach us, and for the fathers who stand by their side and encourage them and give them a lift and give them a break and show them your love in the whole process. God, we just thank you for the family today. And we know that the mother's the heart of that family. So we thank you for all of our mothers. Thank you for providing such a plan for us to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. I like the way Luke writes. He's, he's an interesting writer. And when, when he says something like, in the meantime, what's that mean? <laughs> Uh, that always tri triggers my mind when I see a phrase like that, a transitional phrase. So it means that while something else was going on, this is going on. It's like some of those novelists who write a book and they start you out and they tell you a little bit of information about a certain situation or people in a situation and then, then they stop. Then they tell you about another situation. Then they stop and you think, what happened to that first situation? Then there's a third, and maybe a fourth. And finally, you know, they begin to weave it all together. It's, it's kind of a different way of doing things, but uh, I do like a story, so it, it intrigues me to keep on looking. So when, when Luke says, in the meantime, well, what had been going on that he says now, in the meantime? Well, you back up to chapter 11, it starts out, now it came to pass. And all of those transitional phrases tie you into something that's going on before and in this chapter 11 you know he was basically describing things to his disciples he knew he was going to depart fairly soon there were certain things they needed to know yet and apparently he felt they hadn't got it yet so he was trying to help them remember and understand the principles that he felt would help them to navigate through life in the kingdom of God I feel at this age in life, uh, where, where I'm teaching basically older folks, that my job is to help us to remember and to help us finish well. That's my task at this point in life. I'm not sending anybody out and, you know, when they come in their walkers, you know they're not going to go far. Uh, <laughs> so I thought, what am I doing? Well, I'm helping them to remember because the Bible says over and over, remember, remember, remember. And, and I forget more and more and more. So I need to remember. So Jesus is, thought it was time now to kind of bore in on these men. And so Luke records, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled on one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, now that piece of picture in my mind, you know, uh, people began, more and more people began to follow Jesus and walk around after him because they had seen some things happen. And you know, Jews seek a sign. So they were following him around to see if he would perform another sign so that they would know he was definitely sent from God or not. Even John the Baptist sent some people and said, Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? And what did Jesus say? Well, did you notice that the blind see, the deaf hear, and the lepers are healed? Did you notice that? Those are signs. Come on. That's your sign. So these people coming here and they're elbowing to get in to see because they think maybe Jesus is going to perform another sign, another healing, whatever. And But the crowd keeps growing and growing till Luke says it was innumerable and they trampled on one another. 
like a, like a bunch of people at a sale at the Walmart or something, you know, they kind of yeah, get rough with each other. And they were looking to see what could happen and standing on their tiptoes. Did you see anything? Did you see anything? And then what does Jesus do? He began to say to his disciples, first of all, here's all of these people. He could have preached, wonderful opportunity. But what was his concentration? His concentration was his disciple. You guys gather in here close. I want to tell you some things yet that you have not heard or maybe you've heard and didn't understand. But these things I'm telling you are very, very important. And the crowd kept, keeps pushing, pushing. So what's the first thing he says? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, now what is leaven? You, you know, all of you ladies who make bread, you know what leaven is, you know. You put a little in the dough and it goes through all the dough and changes its nature, doesn't it? If you don't have leaven, uh, the bread's not so good. But if you have leaven and it operates correctly, it permeates the whole loaf. And in the sense of bread, it makes it better. But Jesus isn't talking about the leaven that does something wonderful. He's talking about leaven that is not good. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, that's an interesting word. I, I'd like to think that's something that somebody else does, but not me. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, in my understanding, is that you say one thing, but you do something different. You know, all of, all of you who have been parents, you know that at some point in time, you're going to do something, and one of your children is going to walk up and say, Dad or Mom, you told us not to eat that. What are you doing? You told us not to do that, and what are you doing? You teach children things, they feed it back to you, Right? Or, or were my kids the only ones that did that? You know? That's what happens. And hypocrisy means that you taught them something and then you ended up doing the same thing yourself. That's hypocrisy. Uh, the Pharisees, why were they filled with hypocrisy? They taught the law. They taught the law of Moses. They taught the prophets. They taught everything that God had taught them and they taught it in a correct way. But they didn't do what they taught and that's hypocrisy uh, I don't know how you get around those things when it occurs in your life uh, but what we do is begin to rationalize and make excuses or blame somebody else hey that's easy to do that's the, that's the current trend in all of society just blame somebody but Jesus wanted his disciples to know that there is the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For he said, there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you've spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the housetops. In those days, the roofs were flat, and if you stood up on the roof and hollered for your kids, they could probably hear you a block or two away. So he said, what's done in secret will be hollered from the rooftops. How many times have you heard something over TV in some expose of some important person, religious, political, or otherwise, and where, is, where are our antennas? On the rooftop, you know? That's where they used to be. And, and so it says the things done in secret will be shouted from the rooftop. I don't think that's what Luke had in mind, but that's what's come to pass. If things done in secret will be shouted all over the world. That can be heard all over the world in seconds now. So Jesus said, beware of their hypocrisy, their leaven. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has the power to cast you into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Well, he's talking about God, he's obviously, because those are capital letters. 
I don't think God seeks to kill us, but inadvertently we all die. And after we die, what is the outcome? This, this is a, a, a definite teaching that there is a hell, because Jesus said, beware of the one when you die that can cast you into hell. So if Jesus said there's a hell, there must be a hell. Either you believe Jesus or you don't believe Jesus. Either you believe his word or we don't believe his word. It's up to everybody. And he sends no one to hell. We make our own choice. We have a choice to follow him, to accept him, accept his premises and repent of our sins. And he says if we do that, we will be with him in heaven. But if we don't do that, the alternative is we have chosen our own path and we're sent to hell. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but that's what I've been taught since I was a kid, and that's what I believe. In fact, when I went to revival services, we had some good old time, you know, loud pulpit-thumping guys that talk, talked about hell a lot. And I think when I went to get forward at age 10, I went forward because I was scared to death of hell. I didn't want to go to hell. And that was my first encounter with God. And I had some buddies that felt the same way. We all got, went forward and got baptized at the same time. Well, since then, my, my respect for God has nothing to do with that kind of fear. But my respect for God has something to do with his awesome place in, in the history of the universe and the awesome things that he has done to benefit me and my loved ones and you in the process and the fact that he lovingly took on himself all of my sin, which I didn't fully understand at age 10. And he took that to himself and bore it on the cross, took his own blood, planted it on the altar in the heavenly of heavenlies, and declared it's finished. I understand that as an adult. I didn't understand that as a kid. So Jesus is trying to explain some things to his disciples that maybe they have not understood to this point. Now he said, to understand the value of this, let me tell you a little more. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all remembered, are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. You know, self-worth, that's, that's a big issue. And all of us need affirmation so that we feel we're worth something. If you grew up in a time when, you know, they didn't preach encouragement to kids, I think my, my dad was afraid to encourage his kids because he thought they'd get the big head. I really feel that was his rule of thumb. So basically when you made a mistake, he would, he would chew you out and say, well, that's not the way to do it. You don't seem to be learning. You'll never amount the hill of beans. Just, just a whole tirade of things that made you feel who, you know, little, small. And some of you have lived through that. You've lived through that kind of admonishment. In his own mind, he was thought he was encouraging us, see. He thought he was teaching us to do things correctly. But inadvertently, he made us feel less than we should have felt about ourselves. But Jesus comes along and says, but, but watch the sparrow. God cares for that sparrow. Not one falls to the ground, but he knows it, see. And the hair is on your head. Hey, how's important the hair on you? How many times you cleaned your brush out of all the hair and throw it in the wastebasket? You know, we, just, we don't think that much about hair. But my hair is on my head are numbered. Incredible. I wouldn't think to do that, would you? But God does. God cares about every little thing that you think, feel, and do. I don't care what it is. And if, if your God isn't that big, I'm telling you something that you need to know. God's big. He's bigger than anything you can conceive. He's bigger than all your problems. He's bigger than all your hang-ups. If, if you have things in your life that you have not surrendered, you surrender them, and the loving Jesus will quickly take them away from you and make you feel different about yourself. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful what Jesus can do? And if he can do that, and he's concerned about the sparrow and the hairs on my head, he says, and also, also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, 
him the Son of Man will confess before the angels of God. Well, I didn't really know the angels wanted to hear about me, but apparently they do. Because when I confess Jesus, the angels in, he are in heaven are rejoicing because I'm confessing Jesus. And, and if I confess him before you, they're rejoicing. And that's what I'm doing. I'm confessing that Jesus is your answer. I don't care what your problem is. He's your answer. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So there's the deal. This is, the, this is what he says. Confess me before people, and I'll confess you before the angels in heaven. Deny me before people, and I will deny you. He will say, I don't know you. I deny you. And that's pretty awesome. That's a shaking statement to me. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Oh, this has been a big debate, you know. What's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? I've heard that ever since I was a kid. And we used to know a poor lady who believed that she had blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. And she came to our Bible studies. We prayed with her. Other people prayed with her. I've seen people have her down on the floor casting out demons and you know, all kinds of things to try to get her convinced that she would, had not blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. I don't know that she ever got it. I, if, I feel so bad that there's no, no way anybody seemed to communicate to her, no, you have not blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Perhaps she didn't understand it. It says if you blaspheme against Jesus, that can be forgiven. But if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now, now this is my take on that. This may not be yours. But the only way you can blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is when he comes to convict you and says, you need to come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. You say, get lost. You deny him. You will not accept his invitation. See? It's like the, the guy on the roof in the flood. And he was there, and the flood got higher and higher, and somebody came by in a boat. You want some help, buddy? Nope, I'm waiting on God to help me. And a couple people offered, nope. Well, finally, the flood came, took away the house. He died and went to heaven. He said, God, I prayed. Why didn't you help me? He said, I sent three people, and you refused them all. So here you are, you know. If we refuse the invitation of the Holy Spirit, and you say, well, God never speaks to you. Yes, he does. God speaks to every person on the earth. There is not one person that God does not speak. If he's concerned about the sparrow, he's concerned about what you're thinking right now. And if you think you can hide your thoughts from him, guess again, you cannot hide your thoughts. One of the first songs we learned in Sunday school was you cannot hide from God. You remember that song, anybody? You cannot hide from God. He will hear you. He will know you. And then mom would make us pray that prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Remember that prayer? So I lay there in bed thinking I can't hide from God and I've done some stupid things. And man. What if I do die tonight? What will happen to me? And, you know, I've dealt with that question for a lot of years. Now, I don't, I don't fear tomorrow. I don't fear dying because I know who's there. I know who takes care of you after you die. I know who will be into tomorrow. See, tomorrow, a tragedy could happen in your life and my life. And what will we do? Curse God and die like Job's wife recommended? No, we will trust God. And we'll pick up things right where they are and try to get it, get through it. See, I've, vision, I've been around several people who have lost everything. Lost their home, lost their goods, lost their personal things. Everything's gone. Like in a fire or like in a tornado. Everything is gone. What do you do? What will they do? They just pick up, begin, and things begin to come together. And pretty soon they're back functioning somewhat like they did before. With, but with a lot less stuff. See? They, but they function. So I want to proclaim Jesus before men so that he proclaims me before the angels in heaven. Now, he says, when they bring you into the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, to, do not worry about what you should do or sh should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you might say. 
Now, I've been in a couple situations where I was praying, God, what should I say? What should I say? A couple of times he said, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> that works too. Sometimes you should say nothing. Sometimes he will give you an answer for whatever is asked of you. But, but I do believe that in a tight spot like that where you are being interrogated, that you should just say, God, what should I say? And the story that comes to my mind is these two young men who were captured in Iran some time back. And they've been since released. But this one young man gave his testimony one time on television. And he said that every day he went in and they would interrogate him. They would beat him. Uh, they would break open old wounds. They would, uh, you know, slap him around and just treat him terrible. And he'd go back to his cell hurting. Uh, doing the best he could he had he had some water in the cell and that's about all he had and they fed him but he every day he was beat up beat up beat up and he got to thinking I'm probably going to die here so maybe I ought to hurry it up so he filled his sink full of water and he tore his sheet in strips and made it into a rope and and he figured that he couldn't hold his head under water too long so he would put his head down in the water and then quick tie the rope and make himself stay there until he drowned. Well, he tried that several times and it didn't work. He couldn't do it. So he's sitting on the wall, down by the wall, and he, oh God, he said, what am I gonna do? I can't stand this anymore. I can't kill myself. What am I gonna do? And then the thought came to his mind, just strangely the thought came to his mind, forgive your enemy. What a time to hear that. And then the Holy Spirit spoke in his mind and said, do you know the name of the guy that's interrogating you? Well, no, I've never asked. I don't know what his name is. And, and he heard the Holy Spirit say, ask him his name. And so the next day when he was hauled in before the interrogator, he said, you know, sir, I'm probably going to die here. And you've been my interrogator the whole time. But I don't know your name, so... What is your name? And he reached his hand out. And, and the, the guy was stunned. He said he was just stunned. He just sat there and looked. And finally, he, he slowly reached his hand out and grabbed the prisoner's hand. And the minute he did that, that guy was being to shake like he was hit with a bowl of lightning. There was no interrogation that day. Later, they heard the guards talking about these strange guys talking about what might have happened you know and in a few weeks they were released see in a, in an impossible situation sometimes God has a plan that you don't even think of you you would never conceive of such a plan you know if somebody was beating me every day I would be thinking of ways I could get even wouldn't you some way I could follow up the plan that they're in right now I'd think I'd be thinking of all kinds of stuff but he had the heart to say, Lord, what am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do? Well, that's a good place to begin. That's a good place. And the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide my inheritance with me. But he said of him, to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? I like that answer, you know. Who made me an arbiter over your situation? And he said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. You know, I've, I've witnessed this many times since I've been pastoring that uh, families get along fairly well, but until uh, mom and dad die and the estate is left to be settled. Maybe some of you have been through that process. Um, that's why it's, it's good for us to have things kind of in order, name who we want to be the, the executor of the estate and have some process in place. So the poor fellow who's left to, you know, determine what needs to be done isn't left just floundering, but has some idea of what needs to be done. My dad and mom, I don't think did anything like that much. I, I think it was pretty much left up to whoever was the executor of the estate and one of my older brothers was named executor of the state. And he went to a lawyer, talked with a lawyer, 
You discuss with a lawyer what he would do uh, with the estate, and and, and he, my brother said, I'm going to take this before my brothers and sisters and see what they think of this idea. The lawyer said, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. He'd been through it too. Don't do that. Don't take it for, for your brothers and sisters. Well, my brother said, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And the issue was this. When uh, uh, my eldest brother died at a rather young age, 64, and dad got a hold of some money. I don't know where it came from. Don't remember the story. But, but he decided to divide up and give each of the children, all nine, well, all nine of the ten children, give them 800 bucks or something like that. Just it wasn't a very big amount. But in that day, it counted quite a bit. And he did, he gave that to everybody except the oldest brother's wife. He didn't give it to her because he was making lots of money. He probably made enough money, he could have bought us all out. You know, he worked as an engineer all of his life, and he was rich, in our, according to our state. So dad said he doesn't need it. Well, this offended my sister-in-law deeply. She didn't have much to do with us before, but after that, cut us off. We'd go to visit her in the nursing home, and one brother managed to get in and out a few times, but finally she accused him of stealing, so he couldn't come anymore either. She reported him. He's been stealing. He wouldn't steal anything, you know. He, he's that kind of a big teddy bear heart and loved her and was just trying to be a good brother-in-law to her. And so she cut everybody off. So when the estate was settled, uh, my brother said to all of us one time we were gathered for Christmas, he said, now, what I'd like to do is, is cut a check for, for this sister-in-law for the amount that Dad gave everybody else. What do you think? Everybody said, yes. Everybody agreed. And that was done. He said some more things that he wanted the, the group to settle. Everything was agreeable. And the lawyer said that was the most peaceful settlement for a big family that I've ever witnessed. Now, it was the principles of let's be fair, let's be just, Let's do what's right. It's those common sense things that dad and mom kind of beat into our heads, you know, through the years that were really what helped us to get through well. And so Jesus says, just beware of covetousness and don't take much stock in the abundance of things that you possess. Then he said a parable. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? What a problem, huh? A lot of guys like to have that problem. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. Then I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry and buy a plot down in Florida and go enjoy yourself every winter. You know, something like that. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. Now we understand that principle, but do we understand how we do that? How do you lay up things in the kingdom of God so that you're rich towards God. How do you do that? Well, a while back when the money markets begin fluttering all over the place, and I know several guys that play in the stock market. I don't. Never had the courage to even try. Uh, what few stocks we got were given to us, and they went up and down, up, and now they're down, way down. They're not many, but it's, we've just watched it, and it up and down, up and down. So one of my friends that uh, didn't have a lot, he said, well, he said, I have some that I can put somewhere where it's safe. And he said, I prayed to God, and we prayed and fasted, my wife and I, and this is what God said, invest in my kingdom. That's what this says, isn't it? He said, invest in my kingdom. So you know what? He said, every time we see a need that we think is kingdom related, we make a donation. And he's still around. He's still here. I don't want to ask him, you know, month by month or year by year, what's, how's it going for you? He's still around. He's happy. So he's investing in the kingdom. See? So when I have something extra, should I 
find a safe place for it or should I invest in the kingdom? That's a question every believer has to handle somewhere. We have to handle that question. And, and as I look back over my life, have I invested more for myself or have I invested more in the kingdom? Which have I done? You have to ask yourself that question somewhere in this journey. Have I laid up for myself treasures where God takes account, where God keeps books? Or have I just tried to take care of myself and mine? Now, I'm not saying you, 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 you be stupid, but there is a place where we invest in his kingdom, right? And, and you have to decide in yourself and your own family how that's going to happen. You have to decide that. Uh, we believe in tithing, but we also believe in giving to missions. So we do both. It's not that we have a lot, but we believe that what we have, we're, we're obligated to divide up among various kingdom work that the Lord has shown us that is valid and good and right. So I don't know how you assess that, but he said, he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. I had a friend one time who had done real well. Every, every uh, business venture he tried just <laughs> grew. He was in a period of time when it invest in things really work well for him. And I presume he was over a, a millionaire or more. You know, he had a lot of money, a lot of estate, a lot of property. So I asked him one day, I said, how will you know when it's enough? <laughs> well, he said, I'd like to sell just, if I could just sell another package of nap napkins, I'd be happy. <laughs> well, that's not much, but he still wanted a little more. A little, a little bit like this crowd that was trampling the disciples trying to see if Jesus was going to perform another sign. How many signs do you need to believe that it's Jesus? They wanted to see a, another sign, another sign. Answer my prayer again, God, and then I'll believe you're there. How many prayers has he already answered? And do you daily give thanks for those things that you've gotten from him and you know came from him? See, I, I'm a debtor to God so deep that I, I would have to live 10,000 years to be in, pay, pay the interest. Amen? That's how much God has done for you and me. So what can we do in his kingdom? Well, obey what he says. That's one way we become rich towards him. He said, therefore, I say to you, verse 22, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. We call them crows here, but the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap and ha have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? You know, God feeding the birds. You know, I don't know if you watch it, the outdoors or not, but I'm a, I was a student of the outdoors. I've watched it ever since I was a kid. Now watch the birds. You know, when snow's on and there's sparrows and wild birds around, some people feed them. But where do they go for food when we see there's nothing there? Ground's covered, ground's frozen. They can't get bugs and grubs out of the ground because it's frozen. Where do they go to get stuff to eat? Well, we live in a city and we know they go to the dumpsters, they go to the parking lots. Every parking lot has its own, you know, resident flock of birds that check, check out everything you drop. You know, you drop something, they're there. I came out of Rural King one day and was mobbed by a bunch of sparrows that were there because I was carrying a bag of popcorn. So I just kind of let a little trail and watch them fight for it. It's kind of fun. But a couple of winters ago, the crows, uh, the, the, the uh, snow had ice on top of the snow. So I began feeding the crows and I found out then there was a flock of them or a, a family of them lived just back of us in the woods. And, and uh, so I began watching them. And then I saw that video about how wise crows are. They remember your face. Remember, any of you see that? They're, they're really wise birds. I knew when I was a kid, if I walk in the woods with a gun, there's a few loud cries, and they were all gone, you know? They saw me coming. The man has a gun. Let's go. So I 
tried to be a friend to these crows, and we'd put stuff out there for them, and then I'd make a little crow noise, and pretty soon here they come, calling them in. To this day, they still hover over that spot every day a little while just to see if we're giving them something. So that crow knows where to get food. And I, I know it's the same crow because one of them has a wing that hangs down like this, like it had been broken once or something. I don't know if it's a he or a she, but I call it droop wing. And I know when droop wing comes, usually there's about four other crows with them, some of them younger. And so when they come, I know that that's the crow that I befriended. But they've gotten so they trust us. And you don't pet them, you don't get near them, but they're there when we're there. And it's kind of interesting. So, but I'll tell you this, I wouldn't want to eat what they bring me. I just would not do that. I'd have to be mighty hungry, like, like it did one of the prophets. But consider the ravens. They neither reap nor store anything, but God feeds them. How much more will he feed you and me? How much more will he take care of your needs and mine? Or consider the lilies, verse 27, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The, the beauty of flowers that we get to enjoy every spring, we don't take that for granted because there's, there's something in, in a flower, in, a, in something that grows, that, that speaks something of God and God's creation and God's way of blessing us with beautiful things. So if God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? So, so when I get anxious and worry, what, what is that? Is, that? is that just a lack of faith, or what is that? Is that a sin to worry? And what does worry produce? More worry. So we shouldn't take too much thought about how we're going to survive, but trust God, because he takes care of the grass and the birds and, and, uh, and everything else. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind, an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. So, so why pray for these things if he, if he knows you need them? Why pray? You ever think of that? God knows everything. God knows it before I pray. He knows my thoughts. He knows what I'm going to say. He knows what I'm going to pray about. So why pray? Well, I think when we pray, we vocalize more what's really in our hearts than at any other time. One woman told me one time, she said, I learn more about my husband's character when he prays out loud with me than any other time. You want to hear that again? I learn more about my husband's character when he prays out loud with me than any other time. And just that quick, I said, you know why, don't you? He feels he has to be honest before God. Amen? You women say amen? <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's funny. <laughs> to quote a guy I know. <laughs> and do not seek what you should eat or drink or what you should be, and be not anxious have an anxious mind. For all of these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. Now, what nation in the world would not like to live in America with our standard of living? The nations of the world would love to come here. And, and if you look around your house and see all of the things that you really need and the extra things that you have, I was just thinking that the other day. I wonder how many households we could start up and equip with just enough to get by if we just divided all this stuff up we have. And after so many years, we've just accumulated and accumulated. Somebody on Facebook a while ago took everything out of their garage and set it out in front. And I looked a little bit and I thought, how did they get all of that stuff in their garage and their car too? I'll tell you, some of us are pretty good packers. We know how to pack stuff away, how to store stuff. And what good is it? What good is all the stuff we store? It's going to perish, and we're going to perish. 
but seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. And that's what my brother did. He said, I'm going to seek God's kingdom first, invest there, let God take care of us. Do not fear, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, the kingdom. Not a job and a house and a pension and all that. He's to give you the kingdom. What's the kingdom? Is that different from the church? Well, my opinion it is. The kingdom is what God has established on the earth that calls all people to hear his voice and follow it, whatever he says. Just like Jesus said. Jesus said, I only speak what I hear the Father speak. I only do what I see the Father do. So when you see the Father doing something, come alongside and help. You hear the Father speaking something, speak it to your brothers and sisters. It may bless somebody. It may help somebody. It may set somebody free. But if Jesus need, needed to do that, how much more do you and I need to do that? We need to be with the Father enough that we hear what he speaks and see what he's doing and come alongside. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourself money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches or moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I'd like to send you out with that thought. Where is your treasure? What do you treasure more than anything else? I think we each have to answer that question somewhere when Jesus asks us that question. We have to answer the question, where is my treasure? And if that grips my heart, is that God's will that that treasure grip my heart? Or am I looking in the wrong direction or putting my value in the wrong place? It's a, it's a serious question. Jesus said it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And out of the heart comes, you know, our thoughts, our intentions, our direction, our purpose. All of those things come out of our heart. Once we see something to do, we will to do it. Or once we see something wrong, we will not to do it. But out of the heart comes all of the issues of life. And if your heart is right with God, good things will come out. It will benefit you. It will benefit others. You will be a servant in the kingdom of God. So who, who are the servants in the kingdom of God? Those who, who hear his voice and accomplish what he says. Those are the people in the kingdom of God. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Music team, if you want to come. We thank you for what your service today. It's been great to have you here. Well, Father, uh, we commit these words to you, knowing that uh, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And you can already see our end, and you can see the outcome of our life. You can see the outcome of what we've invested and what we've thought was important. So bless us, Father, and help us to be wise in your ways, wise in your teachings, and, and prepare us for the day, O Lord, when we can meet with you and live with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
true song, it's a true statement. We are nothing without him. I thought as I close today, I would just uh, give this kind of an instruction. How many of you are working through a problem that you have not solved? Just hold up your hand and then put it down. Look at us. Look at us. Where to go but to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this group of people who love you and gather weekly just to see what you will do and hear testimony of what you have done through our brothers and sisters and to receive encouragement and blessing. May your blessing fall upon us today. You saw our hands. You know our hearts. You know what tomorrow holds. And I just pray that your sweet Holy Spirit would come and baptize us all afresh with an open blessing from heaven to help us understand that we're not alone in our problem solving, but you're here and you have an answer. And like that poor boy in prison who thought it was all over, he sought you one more time and hallelujah, he's free. That's what we want, Lord. We want your answer and we want to be free. It's not a test to know whether you're the real one. We know that. But it's our heart's desire to be free to serve you more fully, more completely in the future than in the past. And we all pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.